Uh, good afternoon, I'm Adrian Davis and uh, my co-director Suzanne Aldry is sitting to my right. We're going to do a double act. I've just realised that due to something going on at lunchtime here on the screen, we've lost a, light, a bit of the right-hand side, so I'm going to have to perhaps say some of the words that you might have been able to otherwise read. So supportive, healthy, inclusive neighbourhood environment. So we are about keeping people well. Um, and that creates in its own way some difficulties and there isn't a classic uh, care pathway to go along to perhaps try and improve but it's how do we try to use the built and natural environment in the city to help people to be both physically active and also to get the mental health benefits uh, of being out and about in the uh, environment. So uh, Shine's aims, uh, so supporting healthy outcomes through neighbourhood planning um, so the neighbourhoods is really at core, the worldwide evidence really around um, built environment, natural environment is uh, in, certainly in urban areas, it's at the neighbourhood level that really counts, we've really got to do the investment, uh, you can talk about city wide things but it's at the neighbourhood level you've really got to focus your attention. Um, so we're focusing on neighbourhoods uh, and developing an evaluations with a focus on healthy neighbourhoods and then translating uh, finding as evidence, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, and providing opportunities for implementation in Bristol, and that's beyond, I think, I'm guessing at that. <laughs> but I guess this is interesting bit, slicing things off. Anyway, so who we are, so Suzanne Aldry from the University of Bristol, who's said a bit more about herself perhaps in a moment. Uh, Marcus Grant, who's not in this room now, is in another uh, room. Uh, and Becky Pollard, our Director of Public Health for for Bristol. Um, and what we've done, we, we launched in September 13 uh, and as part of a review process I've been leading on for Shine, we decided we really needed the learning after 18 months was several fold, one of which was we really needed to expand the leadership, the directors and leadership team so we could call on more of the expertise and support and people could actually just open doors for us in places that otherwise we don't even necessarily know are there. So we've expanded our leadership team to include these people. Quite a lot of them are inside Bristol City Council because Bristol City Council, in terms of wider determinants of health, is a key player in terms of built uh, and natural environment. Um, uh, so yes, we had our launch in September 13. We've gone through 18 months uh, before we decided to go uh, into a review of where we are on a reality check of the things we're doing uh, and to really hone down and think about our aims. The second part really of what I've just referred to in terms of uh, reviewing Shine was taking on board some of the things that David uh, has mentioned uh, from Bristol Health Partners about focusing down. We all started our hits and thought we were going to try and change the world and then realise actually you've got to, in order to deliver on these, you need to focus on just a very few items. So uh, we'll go through, Suzanne and I, just talking about where we are in terms of those particular items in a moment. Um, I've talked about strengthening of the leadership team um, and prior providing a bit of a conduit for professionals and residents and others in Bristol and surrounding areas for some of the evidence uh, work, some of the stuff we're doing, and also translating that work into uh, language that can be used by others. Um, so Shine's priorities are now, we've just had a leadership team yesterday, and we've walking and walkable neighbourhoods is at the quintessence of what Shine is about at the moment. This is where we are at and focusing at that neighbourhood level and then when we're in that thinking about uh, age friendly neighbourhoods not least because many of you will know that Bristol ageing better we've got 5.9 million pounds to be spent over the next four or five years in the city on um, Bristol ageing better and how we do that we also want to try and think about the continuum from the youngest to the oldest because they're the most vulnerable groups and often the old adage is if you can take care <coughs> and make sure we have a healthy start in life and a healthy latter years in life, then it's fine for the rest of us as well. So we're focusing on those. We're talking about open streets, and again, Suzanne will mention that a bit more, about how we use streets in a more democratic way, rather than from the 1960s onwards, perhaps, where streets have really become car parks and places where children can't play, as many of us remember streets where you could use them for play and other activities. 
um, and talk about the natural environment in the urban realm. And to that end, not least, we have Peter Wilkinson, who uh, used to be a uh, head of parks in Bristol City Council, if I've got that right, Peter, um, uh, a few years ago to guide us on, on that aspect. Uh, yes, this slide's lost too much. <laughs> anyway, one of the points of it is about evidence. I think someone's trying to sort it. Oh, okay, right. Is about evidence and really translating evidence. So one of the things that I do, uh, I don't know how many people will know about this, but one of the things I do, I sit inside Bristol City Council's Transport Department, which is an odd thing for a public health decision to do, but I do and I have done for the last seven years part time, and try to nudge, cajole, and push and support them with evidence-based approaches to transport planning. And so I take <coughs> peer-reviewed papers they'd never ever see because they're in arcane journals they've uh, never heard of. They don't even read peer-reviewed transport journals, so. I take the best available evidence, de-jargonise it, put it on one page, put it in front of them. That's the idea. Make it easy, because that's the only way busy people are going to take any notice. So do that sort of translational work. And just for finishing off for me, um, that translational work extends to, in the neighbourhood partnerships we have in Bristol, providing support for lay people in thinking about what are the traffic choices. So we have a lot of... In, in our neighbourhood partnerships, we have traffic subgroups whereby generally people come to them saying, I need a, a crossing facility here to help us to get our kids safely to school, or we need to do something about speed or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so we use the best available, often peer-reviewed evidence, de-jargonised it, provided it on a website that people can go to to be able to think about what are the schemes and some idea of cost, because you may want an intervention you can't afford. So it's about what is the best bang for your buck. So I'm now going to hand over to Suzanne. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so yes, I'm a public health researcher. Uh, so my interest is really in the public health benefits of these um, neighbourhood environments. And this is some work that I have done. I, start, I did the feasibility study in Bristol, the walk to work study, but it's now a full scale randomised controlled trial and that's taking place in South Gloucester, Bath and the, the, the Swansea areas. But what, what I'm showing you here really, um, is some evidence that we've gathered using accelerometry and GPS to show the benefits of walking to work. And you can see, comparing these with them, the, the dark blue are the car drivers and the light is are the walkers, you can see these peaks of activity um, when you expect people to be walking to work and when you expect them to be coming home. And here, this, this actually shows, this is the GPS trace. It's red, it means it's moderate to vigorous physical activity, which is exactly what we want. So that person who's walking is getting NVPA, just building it naturally into their day by the activity of walking to work. So I'm carrying on with that um, randomised controlled trial. Um, but in terms of walkable neighbourhoods, what, how do we make neighbourhoods walkable? Ben Barker's not here now, he was here this morning and he's gone to see another hit but he's very involved with let's walk Bedminster amongst other things so that's a real grassroots thing of making the neighborhood environment walkable just making a more pleasant environment doesn't necessarily cost an awful lot more money moving the bins or just highlighting good routes etc so um, and he kindly invited me to, to launch uh, speak at the launch but um, more recently um, I did a twilight talk whether walking is transport um, and I think it's important that we recognise walking is transport because then we can have some transport budget money to support walking. Um, and that was um, a very lively discussion afterwards and we're really thinking now we need a Bristol walking campaign in the same way there's a Bristol cycling campaign. So it can have some clear targets and we can actually really push for that. Um, in terms of the evidence about what would be a child-friendly neighbourhood, we've just finished, uh, myself and a colleague, uh, Bristol uh, systematic review, um, which is a torturous process, but we were looking at um, interventions where there was a child health outcome reported, there was some kind of change to the built environment that it was aiming to support children's health, and that there was some kind of control and comparison. And you can see that, you know, although we identified 9,700 uh, records, you end up with, say, 27 studies that have that, that the, the element of rigour that we really need. Um, and from that, um, the most promising interventions were uh, changes to promote active travel and walking to school is, is a great thing if we can get children to walk to school and parents to let their children walk to school. Um, and also road safety. So those were the two most promising things that came out of that review. And we're now doing um, a review with the Clark West 
and we're looking at um, interventions to the built environment that promote adult health and particularly um, looking a section of it will look at older adult health so um, and that's just beginning now we're right at the very start of that just this thing about democratic streets is the idea of trying to make streets places that aren't always dominated by um, motorised traffic and I expect you, you'll be familiar with the playing out scheme where they shut the streets just for a couple of hours after school and let children play in them but there are all sorts of things about streets we're interested in how many benches you need to have a lot of people are nervous about benches they think you get drunk sitting on them but they're actually great for us to get older people out and about um, so that's our idea of promoting democratic streets the natural environment in the urban realm that's a, a slice of Marcus Marcus's <laughs> face who's um, I don't know what this is either but anyway um, oh. Um, oh it's gone crazy <laughs> I can just talk anyway. Yes, if you carry on, I'll try. Yeah, so Marcus is, is, um, has been talking quite a bit on the benefits of um, the, the natural environment in the, in the urban realm, but also our real expert is Peter Wilkinson, who's over there, who doesn't live in the urban realm anymore, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but is, is a real expert in it that will be leading, I hope, some work for us on that. So do you want to go, just go to the very the last, last slide? slide. because there he is, you see, this is Peter, where, where he lives. But I just want to say this is um, Totterdown, which is packed, tightly packed houses. Um, and at the very bottom of the street was um, a bit of scrub land, and the council were going to build on it. And we got oh. together and said, we don't want you to build on that, we want a community orchard. And Bristol City Council said, eventually, fine. So for a pound a year, we've now got our community orchard where um, people can plant food and then harvest it whenever they want. And it's, um, it's a great success. I don't know really whether that's improving people's health, so it would be nice to have another systematic review. I think there's some evidence, um, but it would be good to you know, really get tight evidence about the benefits that things like that can have in our communities. And that's it. Great. <laughs> apologies for the technology. <laughs>